gonality is um, and what character varieties are. So I, I hope this is partially a propaganda talk and that at the very least you come out of the talk thinking that gonality is your at least second favorite invariant of uh, Riemann surfaces. Okay, so uh, first I want to give you an idea of what the character variety is. Um, and many of you are experts in character varieties, so I might occasionally fib a little bit, but uh, for what I'm going to talk about, we're allowed to fib a finite amount. So I think I'll be okay. Uh, so first of all, um, I'll talk about the gluing variety, because I think that's the easiest way to get a picture of what I mean. So it turns out that you can make the figure eight knot complement by taking two tetrahedra and lopping off little portions of their edges. I'm too afraid to use the big stick. And gluing them up hopefully in that pattern. So if you get really bored, you can write that down and lop off little edges and at least make sure that when you glue it up, the boundary is a torus. So I want to understand what the possible hyperbolic structures are on the figure eight knot complement. So one way to go about that is instead of those normal looking tetrahedra, I'll think of them as hyperbolic ideal tetrahedra. <coughs> Still, chop off a little portion of each of the four edges, or each of the four ideal vertices. So in hyperbolic geometry, I'm allowed to move around the ideal vertices without actually changing the shape of the tetrahedron up to a single parameter. So I can freely move around three of the vertices and put my favorite one at zero, my second favorite at one, and my third favorite at infinity. But then I'm left with the fourth child over there that determines the shape. So these two tetrahedra are determined by a z, and this one is determined by the z prime. So if you imagine you're trying to determine um, a geometry on this complement and a hyperbolic geometry on this complement, then you need to satisfy the gluing conditions there. So I have to glue A to A prime, and that gives me certain conditions about the shape of the sides that glue together. And there's some other conditions that need to be satisfied with um, angles going around, uh, but the gluing variety is basically all of the conditions you need to satisfy in order to glue those two tetrahedra up in the pattern that I showed on the slide before. So since the shape of the two tetrahedra uh, are just determined by z and z prime, this gluing variety is just going to give me conditions z and z prime must satisfy. And it turns out that in this case, it looks like this equation. So it's a single equation in just the variable z and z prime. Any solution to this equation tells you the shape of those two tetrahedra, and also implicitly is saying that you can actually glue them up with that pattern <coughs> and get a manifold back that is the figure eight. Now, you might be a little worried because Moscow rigidity tells you that there's just one complete finite volume hyperbolic structure, but I never said anything about these shapes being complete or anything like that. So almost all of the solutions to this are crazy looking. But what I want to understand are basically, if you pick your favorite manifold, what the set of all of these solutions looks like. And I'm going to make some restrictions on my manifold. In general, my manifolds, which are all going to be M, are going to be finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds. And they're going to have at least one cusp. And that condition will be apparent a little later on. Okay, so. This thing is called the gluing variety, and I'm going to, because you'll notice in a few minutes, I 
can't draw pictures. Um, and gluing varieties, you know, you need like tetrahedra and gluing equations, and that's all very topological. So, which is frightening, right? So, obvious thing to do would be to use algebraic geometry instead, because everyone knows it's friendlier. Yeah. Why would you call a solution set to that curve? This is a curve of things. So, the Z's are complex numbers, because I can move them all around the boundary of the hyperbolic three space, which looks like C union infinity. So they're both complex numbers. So the, the assertion is that each solution ZZ prime there gives you a different shape that works with the gluing equations. But if we're putting on our algebraic geometry hat, the solution set to this lives in C2, but it has one equation. So I'm cutting out a complex curve in C2. So you just think of it as a Riemann surface if you like, but I think I'll, I'll almost always call them curves. Um, okay, so since topology is hard, what we're going to do is to do uh, an algebraic approach to the same thing. Now, we won't get 100% the same exact set, but like I said before, uh, it turns out that in what I'm after, at the end of the day today, we can lie a little bit, and so it's just off by a small lie. Yeah. Um, can you go back to your picture of the uh, on the upper half plane? Yeah. Yeah, that. Uh, aren't all ideal triangles the same? Oh, but this is a tetrahedra, so. Yeah, but when you start gluing, aren't you gluing triangle to triangle? I'm gluing the whole inside of the tetrahedra to the whole inside of the tetrahedra by four different gluing maps on four different triangles. So it doesn't seem like the triangles put any restriction at all on things. It seems that's like right. those yeah. angles at the uh, along that are putting all the restrictions on it. Right, angles. but you can the um, angles the can angles. be visualized by a sort of projection into this triangle, if you will. So the angles really are kind of carried by the z and z prime. But the boundaries of this thing are an ideal prime. Right? These are infinite yeah. lines. So as you go around, the line can slide on itself, but it doesn't glue. Say that again. These are infinite lines. They're not finite lines. So as you go around in the gluing, you can come around and the line has shifted. So you can't actually glue it. It's not topological. So you can identify, instead of identifying a vertical line by just rigidly going over, you could sort of go over and shift up. So this is why most of the solutions are really not nice looking, uh, in this case figure eight, not common. Okay, so here's the algebraic approach, which you might at first glance think is harder, but you'd be wrong. Okay, so what we really want to look at is the set of all representations of the fundamental group into PSL2C. Okay, but it turns out that's going to be a little bit too much. So let's just imagine we're looking at the set of all representations from the fundamental group into PSL2C. Well, PSL2C is basically the isometries of hyperbolic three sticks. So for each element of the fundamental group, we're getting a matrix that corresponds to an isometry. And in this way, you can hopefully convince yourself that for each such representation, if you maybe go back to the two tetrahedron examples or just imagine the figure eight knot, take a geodesic that corresponds to an element in the fundamental group, and then this is telling you a length of that element. And all together, this representation is basically telling you what the structure is going to look like on the complement. Because I'm looking at representations into the group of all of the isometries. Okay, so usually I'm going to cheat a little bit and use SL2, but that's just be mainly because it's my preference and I don't have to worry about the plus or minus ones. Okay, the problem with looking at all of the representations simultaneously is that you can conjugate 
And all that's doing is sort of rotating around the model. So I wouldn't want to consider two conjugate representations as different because the structure uh, of, that I'm getting, the isometric structure, is going to be the same. So what I really want to do is just look at conjugacy classes of representations, but that's not exactly kosher algebraic ge geometric. So instead, we know that for matrices, conjugate matrices have the same trace. So I'm morally going to do that. I'm just going to look at up to conjugation. But what I'm going to do is instead look at all of the traces. So I'm going to look at the set, and I'm, always, I'm going to call it XM. And if I happen to talk about PSL2C instead of SL2, it'll become a Y. Okay, so this set, every point in it corresponds to uh, this trace function, which is associated to a single row that takes an element in the fundamental group. So a row takes an element in the fundamental group to SL2C, and this trace function is a function that if you plug in any element in the fundamental group, the output is the trace. Okay, so this looks horrible, but it's not so bad. So if we go back to the set of all representations, it's not hard to see that the set of all representations can actually be described as an algebraic set. Uh, and I'll show you an example. But the basic idea is that if we have a finitely generated group, then I have a finite number of generators. I make them go to two by two matrices. That's four unknowns for each generator. And then for each relation, I'm just multiplying matrices. So each relation just gives me four equations in the entries that have to be satisfied. And then the determinant's one, so it's an extra relation. Uh, so the character variety turns out also is an algebraic set. Um, and one way to convince yourself it's not horrible is that by trace relations for two by two matrices, all of these trace functions are just determined by a finite number of trace functions. So this seems a little bit horrible, but just think about the representations, and in your mind, just mod out by conjugation. Um, so one fact to keep in mind for a little bit is that this is an algebraic set, but if you think of the representations, it's clear that all the equations are defined over Q, or Z, because it's just you multiply two by two matrices together and write down what the entries have to satisfy. So this thing is also uh, an algebraic set defined over Q or Z if you want to clear denominators. Okay. So just a few facts. Um, I already said that we uh, were basically using characters because of overkill for conjugate. Uh, we don't want conjugate things being different. Um, and uh, reducible representations are those that the whole group goes into upper triangular matrices after conjugation. These are sort of overly simple representations of the fundamental group. And by and large, I'm going to just ignore the existence of these. You can see that adding the fact that the lower left entry has to be 0 is an algebraic thing. Whatever the entries multiply by uh, in my relations, I just set those equal to 0. Um, and this is the set of things that make it not correct to say that we're just modding out by conjugation. Because you can have two very different reducible representations that have the same character all the time. Um, but since I'm going to ignore those, then just think about it as your each point in the character variety is telling you a conjugacy class of representations. And that's telling you a hyperbolic structure on your map. Okay. And for irreducible representations, that's pretty much exactly what's going on. Um, just a word about those of you that are concerned with Mostow rigidity. 
Um, I'll point out that we actually are going to get just a couple extra points. So we're going to be really interested in the representation that is discrete and faithful. Okay, there's a whole conjugacy class. Um, but since I'm looking at PSL2 or SL2, I've ignored the orientation reversing things. And SL2, I've lifted it a little bit. So I might actually get a couple extra uh, rep characters that correspond to um, a discrete and faithful representation. But like I said, I'm only going to get a few extra, and uh, today we're going to lie just a finite amount, so it will be all right. Um, and before I do an example, there's one part of the character variety that's especially interesting. So unfortunately, mathematicians are sometimes a bit lazy with notation, so I've already said the word reducible, and now I'm going to say it again in a completely different context. So as algebraic geometers, we might end up getting something that looks like the coordinate axes. Now I'm writing everything in half dimensions because I only have chalk. Okay, so the coordinate axes uh, can be thought of like this, right? And they're the result of the equation x, y equals zero. The fact that this equation factors gives us really two different irreducible sets. I can't break up x equals zero into simpler, a simpler set that can be described by the zero set of an equation. And I can't break up y equals zero. But similarly, the character variety could have multiple components in it. So the reducible representations, for example, give you at least one component. And the component we're going to focus on, and you can ignore the existence of any other components from now on, is called a canonical component. So I'm going to write x sub 0. And there might be more than one, but any component is a canonical component if it contains a character that's associated to a discrete and faithful representation. Okay, so it has basically a point on it that corresponds to the finite volume, complete hyperbolic structure on our map. Okay, so just ignore every other component there could possibly be for today. Um, the key fact is that we know the dimension of this component. So uh, if you look, think back to the two tetrahedron gluing together, um, Thurston in his lecture notes uh, outlines the idea, or proves it basically, and it's basically a degree of freedom argument. You have so many cusps that corresponds to so many parameters, um, and so the dimension of the only component we care about for, say, a not complement is one. So we're going to get a complex curve. OK, so here's just a little outline for the figure eight. Hopefully that is the figure eight. So um, I'm picking my favorite presentation. Uh, it turns out that if I choose, I can choose any one I want. And I might get a different set in the end, different equations, whatnot, but the sets are going to be isomorphic in an algebraic geometric, geometric sense. So I'm just going to pick my favorite one. So two generators, alpha and beta, they're conjugate by this commutator word. And for two by two matrix trace relations, I know that the trace will be determined by alpha and beta, and I could use alpha times beta but I'm going to use alpha beta inverse because um, that makes things really a lot more pleasant. Okay, so that's just the statement that if I have a matrix A and a matrix B, all of the other elements of the group are some combination of multiplying, when you look at them as matrices, multiplying A's and B's together. This is just the statement that the traces of matrices are de that are products of A's and B's can be written in terms of the traces of A, the trace of B, and one additional trace. 
I'm sorry, yeah. I, can I ask a really stupid question? On the previous slide, there was a why not. Oh, sorry, that's the, if you do everything in PSL2C. Oh, in PSL2C. Yeah. Thanks. Just in case that's your preference. Okay, so the reducible representations, those that up to conjugation are upper triangular, are exactly when the trace of al where alpha times beta inverse goes is 2. So that's not a hard computation, but I don't want to go through it. Now to determine everything else, if a representation is irreducible, I just have these two generators. It's determined by where they go. They must go, I can conjugate so that the first one's upper triangular. And in fact, I can conjugate so that the off diagonal is whatever I want. And the second one can't also be upper triangular. Turns out I can conjugate so it looks like that. And uh, by writing the lower left entry as 2 minus r, this is where the little cleverness with using alpha beta inverse comes in. Okay, so it turns out you can conjugate that way. Now all of the traces are determined by the trace of alpha, which is a plus a inverse. Trace of beta has to be the same because they were conjugate. So that's why that one also has a and a inverse on the diagonal. So let's let that be our first variable, x. And then these are written in a way so that the trace of alpha beta inverse is exactly r. So I just take the one relation, which was written as alpha w equals w beta, okay, and I just subtract it to be clever. That has to be 0 since I did the subtraction. And when you multiply it out, you exactly get this matrix. That has to be zero. And so these star things, which are exactly this equation, I didn't fiddle at all, have to be zero. So this is just saying for up to conjugation, I can take alpha to go to that matrix, beta, beta to go to that matrix. But for the group relation to be satisfied, I need star to be zero because star being zero is exactly equivalent to, on the level of groups, alpha w equaling w beta. Okay, so I need this to be zero, but I need to write it in terms of traces. So here, a squared plus a to the minus two is exactly x squared minus two. And so when I make it pretty, the character variety is determined by that equation. So that has to be zero. If we make it look all purdy, we could move this to the other side, multiply by an r minus one on both sides, and then do a substitution, x r minus one equals another variable. So if I do all that fancy stuff, it actually looks like an elliptic curve. So the picture is I get an elliptic curve and the reducibles were a uh, plane, if you will. And they intersect a little bit. That's supposed to indicate the intersection. And there are four really special points on the elliptic curve. Okay, those all correspond to discrete and faithful points. <coughs> Orientation reversing in multiple lifts. So what I want to understand is, in this case, we just had one non-reducible piece. The basic question that I want to talk about today is what in the world are these x knots? I have this one example that's an elliptic curve. What else could I possibly get? Or maybe you know you have your favorite manifold, you know what its x naught is, maybe some property of the canonical component tells you something about the manifold. Maybe knowing something about the manifold tells you that I don't know, the canonical component has to have uh, genus zero or something like that. Okay, and just for kicks, I wrote down the PSL2C uh, case for you there. Okay, so before we get into the exact the questions, um, I just wrote up a bit of propaganda. Um, so character varieties have been really uh, useful tools in proving a lot of things. Uh, one notable thing uh, that they're lovely for is that this elliptic curve, actually I drew it with two cusps because 
as an affine complex curve, it hits infinity if you projectivize in two points. So Color and Shalin have this whole machinery that um, part of it looks at valuations of these points at infinity. And these valuations tell you a lot about the manifold. They tell you about surfaces in the manifold and splittings of a fundamental group. So the character varieties can already tell quite a bit about the manifold just by looking at points at infinity. Um, and people will talk about the last one for sure. Okay, so here's the overarching question. We've killed ourselves, imagine, to compute this set of traces. Okay, what in the world do these sets that we get out tell you about the manifold and vice versa? So one obvious question is, um, what's the coarsest invariant you can think of? Well, one really basic invariant is the number of irreducible pieces you get, right? Like the coordinate axes would be two pieces. So I should say that this slide is all bad news. So you could get as many as you want of irreducible parts to your character variety. And they can all be of this interesting type, not the reducible representations. Okay, so that's a little sad. Um, also, you can get um, this, the Thurston theorem tells you what the dimension of the canonical component is. Well, you can get other components of arbitrarily high dimension that basically have nothing to do with the number of cusps. Okay, so aside from the canonical component, dimension is potentially out of control. Uh, a happy thing is if you know your knot is a, say you have a small knot complement, so no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Closed surfaces, then everything has to have dimension one, otherwise color and Shalin's machinery would give you a surface. Okay, also you can get, uh, in the case when you start off with a knot, you can get things of arbitrarily big genus. So in some sense, these varieties can be as complicated as you could possibly want. So perhaps that is. Um, a general question, so the varieties have to be defined over Q because of the equations, but other than that, what as far as I know, it's not known, and this is a little fluffy, but it's not known, is there some restriction? I mean, is there some variety that could never ever occur for some sort of reason? So basically lots of things are just not known about these. All right, so now I want to, what I want to convince you of is that this unknown invariant, okay, unknown to me until recently, uh, called gonality, actually can help us answer a relative version of this question. So instead of just saying, okay, I'm handing you a hyperbolic knot complement, you know, what in the world is the character variety? That's too hard, perhaps, in general, to say uh, a really profound connection. Why don't we dumb it down a little bit? So why don't we, instead of just looking at sort of random things, look at things, uh, one cusp hyperbolic manifolds that are related in some fashion. So the question I want to talk about is, if we take a family of one cusp manifolds, then how are their character varieties related? And in particular, how is this mysterious um, invariant gonality related? For um, so the family of things I'm going to talk about is I'm just going to take a two-cusp finite volume hyperbolic free manifold, M, so pictorially, so exactly two cusps, and I'm going to Dane fill the second cusp. So I'm going to just take a solid torus and glue it in P over Q Dane filling into the second cusp. So for the rest of the talk, uh, M will 
90% of the time be exactly this two cusp thing. And then this filling is a one cusp manifold and P over Q. So for any P over Q in lowest terms, if I pick a meridian and a longitude here, and if I frame this with a meridian and a longitude there, then the P over Q, and if you're not familiar with Dane filling, is just telling you how this meridian gets attached over here. It's going to get attached half the time you do it wrong. P meridians, Q longitudes, something like that. Okay. But I have infinitely many parameters, one for each rational number, uh, and I'm going to get infinitely many one cusp manifolds out of this. Okay. And Thurston showed that all but finitely many p's over q, since I started with a hyperbolic thing, are going to give me a hyperbolic thing. So in terms of his theorem about dimension, I have, so for the figure eight knot complement, that's what the canonical component looked like. And I have this surjection by Van Kampen's theorem from the fundamental group of the two cut, or in this case of the figure eight knot, to the fundamental group of its filling. And that induces, if you have any representation from pi one of the filled thing into, say, PSL2C, then just by composition, you're going to get a representation of pi one of M. So that gives us an inclusion of their character varieties. So this sort of freckled thing holds true in higher dimensions, but I can't draw it. So if you have uh, the canonical component, say, of M, say it's a two-cusp manifold that's a surface, a okay, complex surface, and then its fillings are all their character varieties, canonical components are all complex curves, so you're going to have a surface with a bunch of curves living inside of the surface. Okay. Now it's true that maybe there are different x naughts, and maybe different points are on different x naughts, but that won't actually matter. There are only a finite number of x naughts. So I think what little m is. Little m? <coughs> little <coughs> r? No, you're looking at your third line up there. I don't understand what that m to the p is along these lines. Oh, I'm sorry, m is the meridian. Well, it's slight, a slight line. And l is the longitude. I think in that line, what I mean is, if, let's imagine you wrote out pi 1 of m and included the meridian and longitude. Oh, sorry, it should be those. And included the meridian and longitude uh, as your generators. Then Van Kampen's theorem tells you, and perhaps it should be minus p there, but Van Kampen's theorem tells you that by gluing in this torus, what you're doing is just adding on the extra word in the fundamental group. So the fundamental groups uh, have compatible representations. So the uh, presentations. So you can should that thing say m to the p l to the q equals one or m to the p l to the minus? Yeah. So so it's just at, you're just by doing a Dane filling, you're you can. That's not the thing's an L. Was that? Well, oh, that is an L. I thought that was a. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it, that literally reads m to the p l to the q equals one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the question I want to answer is exact is refers to this picture, but twice the dimension. So I take m. It has two cusps, hyperbolic, finite volume. Look at a canonical component. That's a complex curve. And then I want to look at all of the Dane fillings. Okay, All but finitely many of them are hyperbolic. They also have this canonical component of their character variety. And essentially, all of the canonical components live inside. These points are all canonical components for fillings. And they all live inside the canonical component for the two cusp thing. Except in this question, these points are all complex curves, and this green thing is a complex surface. So the question is, since I have all these curves of related manifolds, 
how are all of these curves related? Uh, except I want to answer it by looking at gonality, and probably you have no idea what that is. So I read some really snappy algebraic geometry books, and people assert things like, it's the second most famous invariant of curves. Which is funny, because I think everyone just stops after the first. So um, the definition is easy. Uh, to understand, if you take a curve, then just look at all of the maps of finite degree onto C. I'm talking about a complex curve, so I'm looking at all maps of finite degree onto C. I have to be a little careful. I want to make sure that it's dense in C, so that means it's a risky dense. Um, and I need to be also a little careful about what kind of maps I choose. So I'm going to talk about rational maps. So the gonality is, a, is an integer? It's an integer. And it's one or bigger, because okay. it's a degree. So if you have a rational curve, the gonality has to be one, because a rational curve is birational to C. So a rational map in algebraic geometry, I have a finite number of variables and a bunch of equations they're satisfying. That just means in each coordinate, it's a rational function, polynomial over polynomial. So we have to be a bit careful when we deal with rational maps, because they're not defined when the denominators are zero. Um, so here's an example of how I think it should illustrate gonality. So hyperliptic curves, by definition, are, are curves that up to isomorphism are given by a really friendly equation y squared equals some polynomial f of x. And to be a true hyperelliptic curve, the degree of f has to be bigger than 2. Um, and I lied a little, because if the degree is 3, then it's an elliptic curve. But sorry. OK, so you can read off the genus by this equation as long as f doesn't have any repeated roots. So the genus is roughly the degree over 2. But the gonality of each one of these is 2. Because I can take the equation y squared equals f of x algebraically and do the substitution w equals y squared. That corresponds to just the quadratic mapping on the y coordinate. So, or squaring on the y coordinate. So I have a degree 2 map between the curve given by y squared equals f of x and a curve given by w equals f of x. Okay, but w equals f of x is really a graph, if you will. And so I can just project the point x, f of x to x. This projection, if you just think of pre-calc, right, I have the graph, I'm just projecting this way, so it's one to one. So my first map was squaring, that's a degree two map. My second map it is just a degree one projection. So I've now given you a degree two map from this curve to C. So these all, and it turns out that there's no smaller degree that'll work. So that's why I wanted the degree to be bigger than two. So these all have gonality two, but they, have, they can have arbitrarily large genus. So in some sense, this invariant is almost orthogonal to genus, but not precisely, so. Sorry, just. Yeah. I think that maybe it's just a typo, I'm not reading it correctly. Yeah. So it's minimum degree over rational maps defined on a dense subset of C? To, so I, I just want a rational oh, map. Oh, to a dense subset of C. Oh, yeah, sorry, that's a blackboard yeah. bolded C. Yeah, OK, fine. Yeah, my bad. The other way would be. <laughs> the last C in the bracket is blackboard bolded. Okay, so um, it turns out that gonality and genus and other your other friendly invariants are related, uh, but by strict inequalities that aren't always sharp. So I will, if I have time later, mention this Brill Noter thing. Uh, just take it for our uh, purposes to tell us that if the genus is bounded, the gonality is bounded. Um, and 
if you ha are in the nice situation of having a non-singular projective curve, you actually have really nice correlations between uh, friendlier invariants like gonality and degree, or uh, and by the genus degree formula, gonality and uh, well, all three of them. Could you remind us what degree is? Okay, degree just think of it as it's the number of points that a generic hyperplane will intersect your surface. Essentially, it's like the degree of the defining polynomials. So it's the variant of the embedding into CPN? Degree depends on your embedding. So it's not the best invariant for us to latch onto. So you could have two isomorphic curves or, say, birational curves of different degrees. That's why this is stated in the very specific case of non-singular plane curve. Do we have canonical embeddings? For, what, what's the right thing to think of? <coughs> for the character variety, is there a correct embedding? No. I mean, you, if you found a lovely embedding in P2, I think you should take it and run. <laughs> <laughs> this, I just wanted to, this is only to convince you that it is actually, there is some relation between all of our friendly invariants. So the degree defines everything if you're in P2. Well, if you're in, everything defines everything, doesn't it? But you have to be non-singular in, in P2, and well, your degree has to be bigger than or equal to 2. This is like an impossibility. This is just too good to expect that you can be in the situation most of the time. All right, so before I uh, tell you exactly what the theorem is, um, I just want to give you one more fact about gonality, uh, which seems too good to be true. So it turns out that if you have a map G, finite degree, dominant just means that the image is dense in Y, or risky dense, uh, between two curves, that basically X and Y, the gonality of those, has to be similar up to a factor of just the degree of G. So for certain, let's say this map phi is the map, the smallest degree map, realizing the gonality of y. Then I can bound the gonality of x just by the degree of g times this degree. But it turns out that I actually get a bound in the other direction, which essentially says that since x is mapping onto y, x can't be less complicated in the lens of gonality than y. Okay, so we're going to use this fact over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, twice. <laughs> so here's the theorem. Uh, it's joined with Alan Reed. It says that if you're in this situation, we have this family of one cusp manifolds that are all fillings of uh, a two cusp manifold that the gonality of their canonical component is universally bounded. So this constant C depends just on the two-cusp manifold M and the framing you chose, the M and L, for the cusp. And then for free, we get some consequences just by those relations between uh, invariants. Sorry, can we go back to the So if I define height of a rational number, this is just me being lazy. Uh, as the max of the absolute value of numerator and denominator. The lazy part is if I have zero or infinity, I'm just going to let it be one. Sorry. Wait, wait. Yeah. Well, what's the, is there, I mean, the height doesn't appear in this theorem? No, it appears on the next slide, though. I think I had them all in one slide before. So is there an example of a family where finality is not? Sorry, so is, is, this, is this going to come down to an algebraic geometry fact? If I have a fam an algebraic geometry family of curves, then the gonality is... Our grounded? family, and if there's an algebraic geometer in the room, what they would say family right. are two very different things. But does your, uh, your family lives in a family? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to outline the proof. Maybe okay. I'll answer the okay, question. Okay. Can I ask a super question about the statement before you yeah. outline the proof? So what I'm confused about is the filled manifold depends only on M and the framing of the filled cusp. Unless I'm misunderstanding what you mean by framing. So, uh, so I'm, I'm just saying that the gonality is independent of P and Q. 
That's what this is saying. Right, yeah. So the framing, depending on what you mean by framing, you know, you can frame it so that you fill the meridian. So the, no? the framing it's statement it's, might be overly cautious. Um, but in, in this statement, it doesn't matter. In the next statement, it actually. Okay, so, so see, it doesn't. So here in this in this statement, uh, for free from some like the correspondences I talked about, you can get bounds for genus and degree. But here, since I'm talking about the height, you might have to if you change the framing, the constant might change because the height depends on is depends on p and q. I'm just going to focus on the gonality statement. Okay, so the so just we're just going to talk about this one. The other two statements are just for free from algebraic geometry. So does C depend upon R or does not? No, that's the point. It's a constant that doesn't depend on R at all. So take your favorite two cup. Take the whitehead link. Do all fillings of one component. You have an infinite number of manifolds. Their gonality is universally bounded. The constant depends only on the whitehead link in this case. So what is the framing? So framing of the fluid. So the framing just, does not appear in this. That's the just for the corollary. Oh, that statement. The height and the framing are just for the corollary. Okay. 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 All right. So we're just going to talk about this theorem now. So I want to show you that I take my two cusp thing, I do an infinite number of fillings on one cusp, and the gonality is bounded independent of the filling parameter. Okay, so first of all, I'm not going to talk about the character variety because that could live, the, when I figure out all these equations, this could live in some really, it's always a curve in this case that we're concocting because we have all of these one cusp manifolds, but it could live in a high dimensional ambient space. So instead, I'm basically going to look at the A polynomial. So take the mapping from the character variety to, in this case, C4, we start with M. The, we usually think of the A polynomial stuff just for one cusp manifold, but I have this two cusp M, and A naught of M is just the image of the canonical component of the character variety, where I'm basically just changing the coordinates to being the meridian and longitude of the two cusps. Okay, so here's my M and oops, the meridian and longitude. I'm using M and L to mean several things, but I don't want to introduce too much new notation. So technically speaking, what I'm looking at is I have an inclusion map of the fundamental group of these boundary components in the fun into the fundamental group of M that induces a map from the character variety of M to the, a set in the coordinates M1, L1, M2, L2. So just think of the A polynomial for a two-cusp thing as being an algebraic set that's almost exactly the character variety, but the coordinates are merid correspond to meridian and longitude. So the coordinates literally correspond to, if I take a meridian and I map it up to conjugation to be upper triangular, they correspond to the, this M or possibly the inverse. And the longitude after conjugation, it corresponds to one of the diagonal elements. So, just like the character variety, if I take a point, that's going to tell me uh, this meridian and longitudinal coordinate for each of them, and up to a finite lie, this is talking about a hyperbolic structure. It's just that now I live in four-dimensional space. Okay, so my setup is that I have this. This is a complex curve. Sorry, surface. And then for each of the filled things, I have the corresponding A polynomial, which is a complex curve. 
But for the filled things, their corresponding image lives in oops, C2, but it just has one cusp left, right? I filled the right hand cusp. The cusp parameters are just now the left hand M1 and L1. So this actually lives in complex two space with the coordinates M1 and L1. Okay, so I have an infinite number here of complex curves. And what I want to do is show that all of these complex curves, the geometry of these, are somehow all controlled. So the oh and um the easiest way to convince you that it suffices to look at the A polynomial curve is that Dunfield has a bound for the mappings of the degree from um, character varieties to A polynomials. And uh, so we can use those and use that lemma that says that if you have a map between two curves, the gonality is basically the same in order to pass the A polynomial. Okay, so this is the idea of the proof. Excuse me. Yeah. Was that map actually by Russian in the geometric component? Not always. Oh, S. Well, so, so if you want to be careful, you can go from PSL to SL, use the lemma, SL to the A polynomial, use it. I mean, it depends on how you want to. But for PSL, it is by Russian. Uh, yeah, if you're talking about what, knots in the The geometric right? I mean, well, uh, well, I mean, there's, you're taking some left. I mean, there's not actually a map from the character variety to the A polynomial that you're doing this sort of your character variety being manifold and character variety is bounded. But anyway, it's effectively degree one. Okay, so but here's the idea. It's fine degree in this context. Though. We have the... A polynomial, the surface for the two cusp thing living in C4. And the A polynomial for that we're interested in lives here. It's for the one cusp thing. Key observation is because the fundamental group only differs by the addition of this word, how do you get this curve in here that's the character variety of the filled manifold? It's the image of the surface and this hypersurface just given by m2 to the p, l2 to the q equals 1. So in order to bound this thing, the curve that lives here, all we have to do is show that the projection into the first two coordinates, m1 and l1, has a degree that's independent of the filling coordinate. And then just bound the gonality of that intersection in C4. Oh, except I don't know how to do that. So what we're going to do instead is then look at the second projection into C2 of M2 and L2. And generically speaking, what's going to happen to the surface is the surface is going to be dense here. And so the second projection of the blue thing is just the curve M2 to the P, L2 to the Q equals 1. And so all we're going to have to do is understand the gonality of that. Okay, so there are two hiccups we can encounter, and I'm just going to try to explain them by the picture of the way they look. Um, but that's the generically what's going to happen. So the first hiccup is that okay, this first projection of the surface, maybe it's just a curve. That exactly happens when you have geometric isolation of the first cusp. So that means the first projection is not finite degree, which seems terrible. I can't do my trick. But the blue curve has to project down to a curve, because the A polynomial is a curve. So it actually is supposed to be the same thing. And I can bound the gonality of the same thing. Infinitely many blue curves go to the same curve, so we're done. Um, I am going to lie just viciously from now on. And here's how I'm going to viciously lie. In algebraic geometry, if I have a finite degree rational map, it can be really bad at certain points, because I could be dividing by zero. 
And so it might not be defined for a bunch of points. But the co-dimension of that set where it's not de defined is one, so a bunch of curves. But also, it might not be finite degree someplace. It's sort of the inverse problem. But the set of points where that fails is also co-dimension one or smaller. So I need to, everything I say is going to be a lie up to finitely many curves. But since my bound is just by some constant I don't know, then for finitely many curves, I can just take the maximum of the gonality of all of those and incorporate it into my constant. So um, I'm just going to now talk about all these maps like they're lovely and defined everywhere and the degree is the same everywhere and, and super wonderful. Okay. So here's the situation we're left with. If the orange surface doesn't map to a curve, it has to be dense in C2. Because it can't map to just a point because it has to contain the a-polynomial curve of all the fillings. Okay, so it's dense in the left-hand side, and for each intersection with each hyperplane corresponding to a filling, I get a different uh, curve up there, which probably projects down to a different curve here. Okay, and then I do exactly what I was talking about. The degree of the map from the surface to this dense subset is finite. And that finite degree induces a finite degree onto all of the blue things with finite exceptions. And so by the lemma, it suffices to bound the gonality of the intersection blue curves up above. Okay, so now I have to look at this, I want to look at the second projection. Again, I have two cases. Generically, you'd expect the A polynomial surface of the two cusp manifold to be dense. If it's not, it has to be a curve, and uh, because if I fill the other cusp of the manifold in reverse, then all the a-polynomial curves would live here. Okay, so if it's a curve, uh, that corresponds to geometric isolation in the other direction. Okay, so we have these two cases. Blah blah blah. Okay. Um, Okay, so in the second case, right here, where the projection on the second coordinate of the surface is a curve, then it turns out that means that this intersection, that we reduced it to understanding this intersection, has a really easy form. Because the hypersurface, the m2 to the p l2 to the q equals 1 thing, we know that projects to m2 to the p l2 to the q equals 1. So generically, it's just going to intersect our a naught of m's projection in a point. So that gives us a really nice format for what, again, upstairs, this intersection blue curve has to be. This really nice form for this intersection blue curve allows us to bound its degree and it's almost a curve in uh, a plane curve. And so we can use a variant of that nice, smooth, plane curve theorem thing that I mentioned before. So this thing might not be smooth, but the singularities just make our life easier. So we just bound the um, degree, which is independent of R, independent of the point, and using some standard algebraic geometry things, we can bound the gonality. So the generic case is when they're both dense, and we use the same exact argument as before to say that the gonality of the intersection, is, it's enough to bound the gonality of the projection of the intersection. Okay, Since A naught of M is dense, that intersection is, well, I have A naught of M intersect m to the pl to the q equals 1, which projects to m to the pl to the q equals 1. So now it suffices to just understand the gonality of m2 to the pl2 to the q equals 1. So all I need to do is now show you that those things have gonality independent of p and q, which seems not 
true. I mean, certainly the gonality is at worst the smaller of p and q, because I could do the p power map or the q power map, whichever is smaller. But it actually turns out that for all of these things, the gonality is exactly one. And this is the algebra that shows it. P and Q are relatively prime, so I can just cook up a map that involves the A and B from the Euclidean algorithm that this map turns out to be birational. Uh, so you can cook up an inverse really easily. And if you look, the Y got sent to X to the P, Y to the Q under this map. And if you call that Y prime, then the image is basically y prime equals 1, because x to the p, y to the q equals 1. So we just played hopscotch. Oh, wrong way. Wrong way again. Wrong way three times. We just played hopscotch. Just to remind you, we wanted the blue curve to the left. We showed that the degree of the mapping from the top to the left was bounded independent of p and q. And then we, sh we just shot it over with the second projection, showed that degree of that map was also independent of P and Q. And so we just needed to look at this hyperplane image. And then miraculously, that has gonality one. Um, so just to state um, over a minute, it turns out that there are things of arbitrarily high gonality. If you fill two cusps of a three cusped manifold, then you can get things uh, where the gonality goes to infinity. So these things, these knots where K and L are half twists, are by two Dane fillings, and the gonality is basically the uh, minimum. The minimum of the number of twists, uh, K or L, over two or something. Questions? Yeah. Why is it called gonality? So this is the simple, this is the smallest degree branch cover. Right? So I think it has to do with the generalization of the hyperelliptic curves. Um, so curves that look like y to the n equals f of x are called super elliptic. And these are studied a lot. And these are called trigonal curves because of the three. And generically speaking, the gonality of these things, many of these things should be three realized by the cubic map. It's, a, it's an awkward term. So this slide is talking about their genera, so, but you guys computed the gonality. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, this was just, so these things, K half twists, L half twists, mm -hmm. are a uh, Dane filling of two cusps of a three cusp thing, and they just illustrate that you can find, I mean, the theorem would be less exciting if the gonality of every one canonical component of a one cusp manifold was bounded for all one cusp things, right? So that's not true, and these are the example. Uh, the KL double twist knot, if K and L are different, if you look at the, uh, okay. the SL2C character variety, the gonality is on the nose to minimum MN, where M and M are defined up there, roughly K over 2 and L. Over so you can find things with arbitrarily big gonality. Is this because you know that they're um, So, with uh, Melissa Mikhaziev and Ronald Van Loyk, we actually computed smooth models for the character varieties. So, they just have one component of irreducible representations. Um, K and L are different. So, we actually have equations, and in fact, our equations are smooth in P1 cross P1. There's a theorem that says if you have a smooth plane curve, then you know what the gonality is uh, by the genus or the degree. Uh, and 
in fact, more is known. If you introduce a singularity, you know exactly how it decreases. So you can just prove a P1 cross P1 analog for that theorem uh, and explicitly compute it, knowing the I degree. So in algebraic geometry families, these invariants are not varying as much? I cannot answer your question. So there are families, uh, one thing I can say is that the things of arbitrarily, or things of large gonality in the algebraic geometry sense actually connect to stuff like expander graphs and things. But these, this is not, I know of no actual connection to expander graphs through this. Yes. But it seems like things of large gonality actually say cool stuff, but um, I'm not enough of an algebraic geometer to answer your question. You should read a paper by uh, Ellen Berg, Paul, and Kowalski, maybe. Other questions, comments? Well, let's thank Kate again.